There are things in this world that science cannot explain. Things that conjure malevolence, where kindness used to live. There are entities beyond comprehension that lurk just beyond our sight. They twist in the shadows, festering in the darkest parts of a mind. There are relics left behind from time to time. Evidence that something is coming. These items are collected and stored in a secret location. Terror lines the halls in the, the Scarab, Scarab Archives. Archives. Well, this is a change of pace, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I haven't used one of these old tape recorders since high school. And I'm lucky that I found one here in the archives. It wasn't tagged and marked like the other relics, so I'm guessing it's an old archival tool? <laughs> you know, maybe I'm not the first caretaker to try these audio recordings. As to the why I'm using this old technology, well, that's complicated. Um, well, I've been growing suspicious of my employers for a few months now, ever since my request to meet with Mr. Lazarus was denied. My father always said that you should know who you're working for, and I think that's especially important when dealing with items that could potentially invite world-ending monstrosities into our reality. So, with Miss Thalo here to shoulder some of my workload, I decided to take an unauthorized field trip into the Lazarus Foundation digital database. It was foolish of me, of course, to not realize that they would have tracking software. But I'm a doctor of ancient texts, not a hacker. So Stewart showed up with that arrogant grin on his face and confiscated my computer for the foreseeable future, said that while he's enjoying my audio recordings, it might be time to get back to handwriting my records now that my carpal tunnel has cleared up for the time being. Pompous ass. It's not like I found anything but more riddles. Something about an abandoned toy store in New York. And a name repeated over and over in every file I found. Emil. Emil Lazarus. Obviously related to my employer, but how? No idea. Well, anyway, thanks to this little baby, I can continue as before, but now with the added benefit of not having to share my findings with Stuart unless I want to. For the time being, my recordings will be for my own benefit. There's pieces down here that I've been wanting to take a look at that weren't necessarily on my docket. Miss Thalo can keep Stuart off my trail by continuing with the pieces we have been assigned to look at. Hmm. Should I let her in on this little scheme? Not immediately, I don't think. Plausible deniability and all that. She's irritatingly chipper, but she seems to have a modicum of intelligence in that head of hers. I'd hate to drag her down with me if this goes belly up. So, I think it's appropriate to begin this first unauthorized recording with a case file I'm quite familiar with, considering that I'm the one who brought it into the archives to begin with. Case file U-967, designation, the book. The book is, well, a book. It's standard book dimensions of 6x9, hardback, pages are yellowed but quite sturdy. It's fairly thick, but by no means a Stephen King-sized doorstop. No obvious markings on the cover, no, no title, no author, no publication details on the interior. Text within is German, translated from the original Sumerian, which is copied from the original and undoubtedly lost source material. This book was the subject of my doctorate, and the entire reason that I find myself in the Scarab Archives at all. I found this book entirely by accident, I should add. I ordered a batch of old text for research into my doctorate on Sumerian linguistics on eBay, and this bit of bound paper was duct taped to the inside of the crate in which they'd shipped it. I contacted the seller, some retired professor whose name escapes me at the moment, but he claimed to have no knowledge of the book's existence. There are two logical possibilities. He's lying and wanted to get rid of the text, which... Once you know the secret of the book, you'll probably sympathize with. Or someone intercepted the crate, opened it, placed the book inside, and sent it further along. That second notion may sound ridiculous, but 
then one must remember that my last audio entry was about a camera with a higher body count than Ted Bundy. There's a long and sordid history of texts that allow one to glimpse ever so briefly beyond the veil of our simple existence. Ludwig Prince's De Vermi Mystery, or Mysteries of the Worm, comes to mind, and of course there are the writings of the mad Arab Abdul al Hazred, more popularly known as the Necronomicon. You know, given the nature of this book's second half, I suppose I wouldn't be out of bounds in labeling it the Chronologicon. No, that's... that's stupid. That sounds like a damn Transformer. <laughs> anyway. The book tells of five entities from beyond our existence. The book doesn't go into detail about their origins, but it can be inferred that they were drawn to humanity from across the Aether as we developed from primordial slime. They appear only as we perceive them to be. I, and the book, refer to them only as the Five Great Evils. The lust for glory, the filth of the earth, the corruption of the innocent, the darkness of the soul, and the fear of the unknown. Their true motives are beyond our understanding, but given their nature, I, and any rational person, would have to label them as purely and simply evil. The evils are, they were, and they shall be again. One, the one referred to as the fear of the unknown, still dwells within its own reality. The rest, however, crossed into our plane of the macroverse and were trapped here by various means by a race of... Well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. The book refers to them as higher beings, whether they were enlightened humans or more benevolent visitors from elsewhere in the macroverse is unclear. Whatever they were, they locked the evils behind great locks that, theoretically, could hold them trapped forever. But these beings left behind keys as well. They must have realized man's self-destructive nature and left behind the means of ultimate mass suicide, which is very considerate of them, I guess? I went into great detail on the evils of my dissertation. And a video shot by one of my mocking fellow students is what drew the attention of the Lazarus Foundation. Turns out they've known about the evils for quite some time. They refer to them as the Open Case Files 01 through 05, and the unstated purpose of the Scarab Archives is to ensure that the aforementioned keys left behind are kept safe and out of mankind's hands, not unlike a toddler and their parents' gun. <sighs> so... Let's begin with a look at Open Case File 02, The Corruption of the Innocent. According to my dive into the Lazarus database, this is the one that our esteemed founder and namesake seems most interested in. Like four of the five evils, the corruption has already crossed into our plane. Its full strength is trapped, locked by the higher beings within the confines of some unknown objects. The book doesn't mention exactly what sort of objects might hold the corruption, but it does say that the items are small and unassuming, like a bit of jewelry or a child's toy, perhaps. The book writes of the corruption as the most sinister and insidious of the evils, the most openly antagonistic, lurking in the dark of the human mind and drawing out our worst thoughts and tendencies. The corruption feeds on us, specifically our misery and our pain. It's possible that some pieces of the corruption currently reside in the Scarab Archives already, though nothing concrete has been found. From what I've read, I believe that the corruption was the first of the five to be discovered by Mr. Lazarus, and is the reason that he created the Foundation in the first place. He's still quite interested, as any information on the corruption or its relics is to be reported to him at once. Directly to him at once. So, let's discuss the lust for glory. She... Oh, damn. Well, that was Stuart. Says there are several new relics that are arriving and need cataloging. I tried sending Isabella, but Stuart insists that I come personally. He had that stupid smirk on his face, so it's likely that whatever's arriving won't be exactly pleasant for me. I asked for a few more minutes so I could finish my notes. I'm on thin ice as it is. Better wrap this up. 
I'll discuss the other evils later, but I feel I must make a record about Open Case File 01, The Fear of the Unknown. Most of the major artifacts that Isabella and I have been assigned to review concern this one. Why? Well, because the Fear of the Unknown, otherwise known as the First Fear, otherwise known as the Endless, whatever you want to call it, it's easily the single greatest threat to the human race at this point in time. The Endless is the only one of the five that hasn't reached our plane yet, and thank God for that, because we'd cease to exist the moment it found its way to us. The book says that the Endless is an entity the size of an entire universe. Can you imagine? A single intelligence in a being of infinite size? Of course you can't. That's, that's, uh, that's kind of the point. We don't even know what, if anything, the Endless wants in the end. Maybe it wants to study us. Maybe it wants to be friends. Maybe it wants to eat us. It ultimately doesn't matter, because if the Endless ever does reach our plane of the Macroverse, it will wipe us out completely in an instant. Two whole universes can't coexist. But there is the possibility that the Endless is not bound by the rules and reasons of our universe. This is a discussion for another time. <sighs> the problem is that the Endless is quite persistent. The sheer number of artifacts in the archives that can be linked either directly or indirectly to it is testament to that. There's simply no way of knowing how many there even are. The book speaks specifically of a medallion and a puzzle box, neither of which are in our possession, according to the logs, but there's no mention of the key, which we do have, or the portrait, or her twin, either, which we also don't have at this time. And on top of all that, the Endless has a number of followers on our side of the Macroverse already, normal humans dedicated to hastening the Endless's arrival on our plane. The religious sect known as the Order of Kalth has been on the Lazarus Foundation's radar for years, and then there are the numerous reports of a man with no eyes that keeps popping up in testimonies and histories dating back to the late 14th century. Can you knock? <sighs> all right. Almost out of time. Here, I've been going on about what the book contains, and I haven't even touched on what the book actually is. If it were a normal book, then it would undoubtedly be on Stuart's shelf and not in the archives itself. This is where the second half of the book comes in. After the section concerning the Endless, the rest of the pages are blank at first glance. Imagine my initial surprise when I was reading the book for the first time. I turned the page and boom! Suddenly it's talking about me. Specifically mentioning my upcoming humiliation during my dissertation. And my being contacted by the Lazarus Foundation. And my assignment to the Scarab Archives. Each page turn revealed more and more of my future. I forced myself to stop once it mentioned a sudden attack of Carpal Tunnel. I showed it to a friend of mine, uh, David Willis, I believe, but to my surprise, he found not my future written in those pages, but his own. He told me how much he'd read, but he too stopped at a certain point and gave the book back. He's tried contacting me since his big lottery win, wants to know if he can get another look at the book. That's the danger of the thing. I have no doubt that if I, or David, or anyone else was to keep reading, we'd inevitably find the cause of our own future demise. But Delbert, you must be saying to yourself, wouldn't such knowledge be a blessing? Couldn't you avoid future mistakes? But that, that's the curse of the book. It is knowledge of what is and shall be. Its words cannot be undone. What it tells will come to pass. Nothing can change that. The passages one reads are incontrovertible set in stone. That, I believe, was the ultimate fate of the book's unknown author. He wrote down all this incredible knowledge of the evils, and all that information must have changed the book somehow, altered it, drew some force from the macroverse, and turned this tome of forbidden knowledge into the ultimate tome of forbidden knowledge. But the author couldn't have known that. 
he must have finished his writing and then found new text that he hadn't written. Text that mentioned him. And then he must have kept on reading. He read until the end of his story. I know, because there's one final distinctive mark on the inside of the book that I've neglected to mention. You see, on the inside of the back cover, there's the imprint of a man's face. It's perfect. Like he could open his mouth and talk to you. If only his lips weren't locked in the most hideous, rictus grin of pain and horror I've ever seen on a human face. I don't know how the author's story ended, but it couldn't have been a happy ending. <laughs>